Hello, my name is Jillian Algren. I'm a professor of theology at Xavier University in Cincinnati. And uh, I'm delighted to be with you here with you at Bellarmine for tonight's presentation, The Enduring Legacy of Pope Francis and the New and Universal Solidarity to which we are called. These pandemic times have been a profound moment for all of us across the globe. We have been learning so much about ourselves, about our world, about some of the ways that we collaborate fruitfully and some of the ways that our ways of communicating, our ways of interacting, and our ways of imagining a better future have been compromised. In all of this, we've had a Pope, history's first Jesuit Pope, the first Pope in Christian history to call himself Francis, who has modeled this process of imagining a better way. As we look at the legacy of Pope Francis this evening, I'd like us to recall some of the things that Pope Francis was saying to us in the early days of his pontificate. And as we return to some of them, I think we're going to see this prophetic imagination that he has been embodying from the very beginnings of his pontificate. So as a church historian, as a person who um, thinks carefully about the traditions of spirituality, Jesuit and Franciscan, um, that have really helped communities embrace holistically relationship with God, self, and others. And as a person who continually leads spiritual immersion experiences in Assisi, Italy, in the footsteps of St. Francis and St. Clair, I'm very happy to open up with you using texts from Pope Francis's own writings, this legacy of Pope Francis that speaks so profoundly and urgently to our day. Let's start with the, with the beginning of his pontificate as he's sitting in the uh, College of Cardinals along with the rest of, the, uh, of them um, in the election process. And he's sitting next to Cardinal Claudio Humus who says to him as he goes up to take on this huge task of becoming Pope. Do not forget the poor. And when he was asked the question, why did I take the name Francis? He said, I wanted to be called after St. Francis of Assisi, the man of poverty, the man of peace, the man who loves and protects creation. And then in this reflective space, that's almost like the person articulating a dream. He says, how I would like a poor church that is for the poor. I think this has been one of his most profound contributions as Pope. And it began right from the outset, not only the poor church that is for the poor, but also embodying the way of encounter. Um, he begins with an interview some of you may know that interview, it was published in America, where he is asked, who are you? Who is this man of first, the first South American Pope, the first Jesuit Pope, the first name, Pope named Francis? We all wanted to know. And so the interviewer asked, who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio? And in a heartbeat, he says, I do not know what might be the most fitting description. I am a sinner. That is the most accurate definition. It is not a figure of speech, a literary genre. I am a sinner, a sinner whom the Lord has looked upon. In his first really public act, his first movement from the Vatican um, to the outside world, Pope Francis, who really is not an avid traveler, he doesn't like to travel all that much, felt very compelled to do a, make a personal visit to the space of Lampedusa, which the more that he prayed with, 
became for him, quote, a painful thorn in my heart. Many of us may remember that first visit, so symbolic and yet also so profound, modeling a new way of direct encounter for, all, for the entire church and the people of God. Immigrants dying at sea in boats which were vehicles of hope and became vehicles of death. That is how the headlines put it. When I first heard of this tragedy, Pope Francis tells us, a few weeks ago and realized that it happens all too frequently, it has constantly come back to me like a painful thorn in my heart. So I felt that I had to come here today to pray and to offer a sign of my closeness, but also to challenge our consciences, lest this tragedy be repeated. Please let it not be repeated. So from the very outset of his pontificate, Pope Francis allows, he teaches this way of not looking away, of not closing our eyes to the profound ways that human suffering is calling the Christian imagination and is calling the human conscience not to turn away, but rather to come close, to engage, to encounter human need in order to respond fruitfully and creatively to the needs of our sisters and brothers. And so there we were with Pope Francis in Lampedusa, experiencing with him encounter as a countercultural force. In his comments there at Lampedusa, Pope Francis said, the culture of well being that makes us think of ourselves, that makes us insensitive to the cries of others, that makes us live in soap bubbles that are beautiful but are nothing that brings even the globalization of indifference. In this world of globalization, we have fallen into a globalization of indifference. We are accustomed to the suffering of others. It doesn't concern us. It's none of our business. A powerful phrase, the globalization of indifference. He goes on, Adam, where are you? Where is your brother? These are the two questions that God puts at the beginning of the story of humanity. And God also addresses them to us today. But I want to set before us a third question. Who among us has wept for these things? Who has wept for the deaths of these brothers and sisters? Who has wept for the people who were on the boat? For the young mothers carrying their babies? And so we begin to see from the very beginning that this culture of encounter, this experience of encounter that Pope Francis models for us is actually then able to give us courage to ask new questions, to have our consciences, consciences appropriately pricked so that we can ask courageous questions on behalf of those at the margins. This becomes one of the patterns of Pope Francis's message and legacy to us today. So in tonight's presentation, I'd like to explore four themes. They, they really move at our, and um, revolve around the core question, what is it to be human? And I'd like to explore that question in four particular ways. First, how God is known in and through encounter. Second, how God is known through and in the bridges that we build. Bridges like the bridges that we make in community. Bridges like the bridges of peacemaking, of sharing, of generosity, and exploring what real communion means. The third theme we'll explore using again documents that uh, Pope Francis has authored the responsibility that we have to one another as members of a human community. And finally, how God gives us the grace to ask, to seek, to wonder, to care, to change 
In other words, how God gives us the grace to explore our humanity actively through curiosity, through imagination, through verbs in active ways, all of the ways that we are actively human. So let's shift into the first theme for tonight, the theme of living in right relationship. What kind of relationship are we talking about here? Well, we can recall the kind of scriptural structure for relationship as a covenant, a covenant in which two sides, two parties pledge something one to another and live in relationship according to that covenant. As human beings, we have a covenantal relationship with God and that covenantal relationship is both an individual relationship and a relationship that we share as a community of faith. That's not the only kind of right relationship that we are called into. There's also the gift and responsibility of living as part of a larger web of creation with specific care for the earth. The way that Pope Francis articulated this in his encyclical Laudato Si on care for our common home, where he calls our attention to the earth and says that the, our earth is burdened and laid to waste. We should consider our earth among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. And of course, the other major theme in living in right relationships is those relationships that are part of the human community. A human community that should is and should be without barriers. A human community where everyone belongs and is cherished. All three of these sub themes are very powerful in Pope Francis's writings. The second theme that we're going to explore is the theme of growth and mutual accountability. Um, I think Pope Francis has been particularly good. He says outright, and we'll explore it in a quote to come, that human growth has a moral dimension. We are accountable to God and to one another. And that we cannot really need to know, or we cannot know where we need to grow and how we might grow if we're not engaging consistently in a kind of deep listening to one another's stories. We need to be walking in one another's shoes. We need to be journeying together toward greater goodness. All of those things are intrinsic to what it means to be human um, and to the ways that we will then um, know how and, and, and where we can need to continue growing. And finally, um, that all of these things, these above the commitments that we've talked about already, bring us a kind of and a particular kind of joy, the joy of connection, the joy of collaboration a joy that we are privileged to know and invited to explore as part of our human journey. The commitments that we've started to describe already bring both a sense of personal fulfillment of being able to live into and toward the uniqueness that each one of us has in how we are gifted, but they also open up for us the possibility of discovering the joy of being a people, of being part of a people, of being part of something far greater than ourselves. These four Pope Francis are the sources of joy um, and they're ours to discover and explore together. So that's kind of where we're gonna, what, what the themes that we're going to review um, through um, some of the, I just wanted to paste them up here. Um, you know that he is both a prolific and thought provoking, provoking writer. We'll be exploring mostly tonight um, Joy of the Gospel and On Care for Our Common Home with a few um, segments from Christ is Alive and a little bit more um, sprinkled in from the call to holiness and some very recent, um, very recent speeches. So let's look at, let's start out um, with the starting point really of Pope Francis's first major sharing of his writing as Pope, which was the Joy of the Gospel. Um, and paragraph two of that describes what he understands to be a great danger. And we have to ask, I think, um, whether or not we're, we continue to experience this great danger today. The great danger, he writes, in today's world, pervaded as it is by consumerism, is the desolation and anguish born of a complacent yet covetous heart, the feverish pursuit of frivolous pleasures and a blunted conscience. 
Whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor. God's voice is no longer heard. The quiet joy of God's love is no longer felt and the desire to do good fades. This is a very real danger for believers too. Many fall prey to it and end up resentful, angry, and listless. That is no way to live a dignified and fulfilled life. It is not God's will for us, nor is it the life in the spirit, which has its source in the heart of the risen Christ. So the invitation from desolation, the invitation to life and joy, which we can discover um, very particularly and very easily and very readily in encounter. And at the outset of uh, Joy of the Gospel, um, Pope Francis really talks about that encounter with the living God, which emphasizes that there's a both and in our discovery of who God is and in our discovery of what it means to be human. That uh, God is alive, that we can have an experience and an encounter with the living God daily, and that that encounter and experience of the living God has inner spiritual direct transcendent dimensions, as well as imminent incarnational, incarnational human dimensions. This is behind Pope Francis's invitation, even exhortation at the outset of his first document when he says, I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ or at least an openness to letting Christ encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly every day. No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. Whenever we take a step toward Jesus, we come to realize that Christ is already there, waiting for us with open arms. And so that invitation is to a life. The life that Jesus gives us, Pope Francis says, is a love story, a life history that wants to blend with ours and sink roots in the soil of our own lives. That life is not salvation up in the cloud waiting to be downloaded, a new app to be discovered, or a technique of mental self-improvement. The salvation that God offers us is an invitation to be part of a love story interwoven with our personal stories. It is alive and wants to be born in our midst so that we can bear fruit just as we are, wherever we are, and with everyone all around us. As we respond to that invitation, we often discover sometimes, you know, both to our surprise and even fairly readily that that invitation allows our lives to flourish and to bear fruit. And in fact, Pope Francis would say that this is our vocation and our responsibility. To respond to our vocation, he writes, we need to foster and develop all that we are. This has nothing to do with inventing ourselves or creating ourselves out of nothing or recreating for that matter, um, out of nothing. It has to do with finding our true selves in the light of God and letting our lives flourish and bear fruit. And I would just add in every era and epoch of our lives. Your vocation inspires you to bring out the best in yourself for the glory of God and the good of others. It is not simply a matter of doing things, but of doing them with meaning and direction. This movement toward growth and toward becoming, toward moving into our vocation is both personal and communal. And the church itself, herself, however you understand that, um, is also engaged in that constant growth, that constant refinement of vocation. Um, Pope Francis said some very profound and important things about that very early on in his first uh, major writing as Pope, Joy of the Gospel. The church which goes forth, he wrote, is a community of missionary disciples who take the first step, who are involved and supportive, who bear fruit and rejoice. Evangelizers, I bet you'll all remember this, right? Thus take on the smell of the sheep and the sheep are willing to hear their voice. 
An evangelizing community is also supportive, standing by people at every step of the way, no matter how difficult or lengthy this may prove to be. It is familiar with patient expectation and apostolic endurance. Finally, an evangelizing community is filled with joy. It knows how to rejoice always. It celebrates at every small victory, every step forward in the work of evangelization. So even though I've kind of, I left joy to be the fourth theme to explore, it's, it's peaking, it's, it's through all the cracks and crevices, it's rising like yeast, it's coming out of the cracks of the sidewalk like blades of grass and flowers. But the more deeply we embed and we engage life, humanity, our humanity, the puzzle and the mystery um, and the challenge of it all, the more that joy really can emerge. To be human, and this was, I think, one of the really profound and beautiful things that Pope Francis invites us to and invited us to at the outset of his papacy, to be human is to be invited into the revolution of tenderness. The point of departure for our going forth is the constant relational invitation of God. And so he puts it quite simply, in paragraph 88 of Joy of the Gospel, in becoming human, God summons us to the revolution of tenderness. And it's the way of encounter that will teach us that revolution of tenderness, tenderness that will um, develop or help us to develop that tenderness in ourselves and also in the powerful spaces in our midst, in the between spaces, human to human. Um, where tenderness is also born and cultivated and nurtured. So he writes, the gospel tells us constantly to run the risk of a face-to-face -face encounter with others, with their physical presence that challenges us, with their pain and pleas, with their joy, which infects us in our close and continuous interaction. Okay, that was kind of the first theme, overarching theme in terms of that question, what does it mean to be human? And extending from that, this next theme, living in right relationship. And I've mostly relied on Laudato Si or on care for our common home for some of these quotes. If the simple fact of being human moves people to care for the environment of which they are a part, Christians in their turn realize that their responsibility within creation and their duty toward nature and the creator are an essential part of their faith. It is good for humanity and the world at large when we believers better recognize the ecological commitments which stem from our convictions. So there's being human and there's being Christian and both of those being persons of faith and both of those are explored, um, our humanity and our faith lives are explored in large part by living toward and into right relationship with one another and with all creation. Disregard, he says, for the duty to cultivate and maintain a proper relationship with my neighbor for whose care and custody I am responsible ruins my relationship with my own self with others, with God, and with the earth. When all these relationships are neglected, when justice no longer dwells in the land, the Bible tells us that life itself is endangered. And so we're called to grow into our humanity. As uh, Pope Francis sort of defines that at the outset of On Care for Our Common Home, he says, authentic human development has a moral character it presumes full respect for the human person, but it must also be concerned for the world around us and take into account the nature of each being and of its mutual connection in an ordered system. The natural environment has been gravely damaged by our irresponsible behavior. The social environment has also suffered damage. Both are ultimately due to the same evil, the notion that human freedom is limitless. That is, that it's not um, tempered by responsibility to one another. Reverence for God, another way of putting all of this, means reverence for all creation. There's no way to express only.
only reverence for God without expressing our reverence for all creation. Here are some great um, other texts um, from On Care for Our Common Home on this theme. The entire material universe speaks of God's love and boundless affect affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is, as it were, a caress of God. For all of us are linked by unseen bonds and together form a kind of universal family, a sublime communion, which fills us with a sacred, affectionate, a sacred, affectionate and humble respect. Everything is connected. Concern for the environment thus needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of society. How are we to grow into right relationship? Here, I think Pope Francis reveals his Jesuit roots. And as a Jesuit parish, uh, we have um, grown into the same daily practice that Pope Francis prescribes at the beginning of Joy of the Gospel and then does himself in the Joy of the Gospel and of course continues to do day in, day out of his papacy. Um, in the second section of Joy of the Gospel, as Pope Francis takes a long loving look out at the world, he says, it is not the task of the Pope to offer a detailed and complete analysis of contemporary re reality, but I do exhort all the communities to an ever watchful scrutiny of the signs of the times. This is in fact a grave responsibility since certain present realities, unless effectively dealt with, are capable of setting off processes of dehumanization, which would then be hard to reverse. Gosh, this was written in 2013. And I think in our post COVID or COVID, you know, current COVID reality, as we look for and look toward what post COVID might look like, there's so much prophetic insight here. Since, let me just go back, since certain present realities, unless effectively dealt with, are capable of setting off processes of dehumanization, which would then be hard to reverse. We need to distinguish clearly what might be a fruit of the kingdom from what runs counter to God's plan. This involves not only recognizing and discerning spirits, but also, and this is decisive, choosing movements of the spirit of good and rejecting those of the spirit of evil. When we take this long loving look at our world, that careful look is going to reveal tensions so here's one, another quote that reflects, you know, the tensions and contradictions in our world. Just as goodness tends to spread, the toleration of evil, which is injustice, tends to expand its baneful influence and quietly to undermine any political and social system, no matter how solid it may appear. If every action has consequences, an evil embedded in the structures of a society has a constant potential for disintegration and death. It is evil crystallized in unjust social structures, which cannot be the basis of hope for a better future. So that long loving look is going to reveal both tensions and things that need our, our, our attention and remediation. Um, for example, in On Care for Our Common Home, as Pope Francis does that, scan of the world, the earth, our home is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. If we scan the regions of our planet, we immediately see that humanity has disappointed God's expectations. And yet, even in this space of brokenness, there is the call to a different way. There is the possibility of something more. All of this can be explored through the work of turning, of conversion, which truly means a turning away from that which is death dealing, disintegrating, not good, evil, malice, and a turning toward the good, a turning toward the one, I'm going to say one here, capital O, who loves us 
the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, and the one who wants to walk with us toward a different, better way. This kind of conversion, Pope Francis says, calls for a number of attitudes, which together foster a spirit of generous care, full of tenderness. First, it entails gratitude and gratuitousness, a recognition that the world is God's loving gift, and that we are called quietly to imitate God's generosity in self-sacrifice and good works. It also entails a loving awareness that we are not disconnected from the rest of creatures, but joined in a splendid universal communion, which links us to all other beings. By developing our individual God-given capacities, an ecological conversion can inspire us to greater creativity and enthusiasm in resolving the world's problems and in offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This all takes us, I think, to our present moment. And I've, um, bear with me, I've only got five more slides, the fifth of which are your questions for reflection. So, um, but it, I think we'd be remiss not to uh, make use of the insights of the entirety of Pope Francis's papacy to help us as we are in the midst of COVID and all that COVID has exposed and laid bare and also of the immense possibility of this moment to together work toward a deeper, greater, more just and more humane social imagination. So COVID adds a new urgency to the crisis of inequality and indifference. Remember he talked about the globalization of indifference back at Lampedusa. And he actually says, this is a moment to dream big, to rethink our priorities, what we value, what we want, what we seek, and commit to act in our daily life on what we have dreamed of. The myth of self-sufficiency and the virus of indifference have been exposed. Now, the challenge that he extended as early as 2015 with On Care for Our Common Home rings deeply true. The urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development, for we know that things can change. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. Our challenge. Many things, he says, have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging, and of a future to be shared with everyone. This basic awareness would enable the development of new convictions, attitudes, and forms of life. A great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. Well, if that's our challenge, what's our opportunity? I would suggest that our opportunity is a new opportunity to explore again the meaning of resurrection in our day and age. Early in his papacy, Pope Francis wrote, Christ's resurrection is not an event of the past. It contains a vital power which has permeated this world. Where all seems to be dead, signs of the resurrection suddenly spring up. It is an irresistible force. Often it seems that God does not exist. All around us we see persistent injustice, evil, indifference, and cruelty. But it is also true that in the midst of darkness, something new always springs to life and sooner or later produces fruit. On raised land, life breaks through stubbornly yet invincibly. However dark things are, goodness always reemerges and spreads. Each day in our world, beauty is born anew. It rises transformed through the storms of history. Values reappear under new guises, and human beings have arisen time after time from situations that seemed doomed. Such is the power of the resurrection, 
and all who evangelize, that would be all of us, are instruments of that power. He describes this in a beautiful way as, quote, a march of living hope. Let us believe, he says, the gospel when it tells us that the kingdom of God is already present in this world and is growing here and there and in different ways. Like the small seed that grows into a great tree, like the measure of leaven that makes the dough rise, and like the good seed that grows amid the we uh, amidst the weeds and can always pleasantly surprise us. The kingdom is here. It returns. It struggles to flourish anew. Christ's resurrection everywhere calls forth seeds of that new world. Even if they are cut back, they grow ag again. For the resurrection is secretly woven into the fabric of this history. Jesus did not rise in vain. May we never remain on the sidelines of this march of living hope. May it be so. So powerful words from Pope Francis, his enduring legacy, um, very, very relevant and potent, I think, in our days. And I would like to, um, I know we're going to break into small groups to um, have a chance to kind of chew on this together conversationally. So here are some questions for reflection. And I believe that Jane will also, as she moves you into your small groups, be placing these questions into the chat function. Um, even if you don't get much farther than what in these word, words really rang true to you, where do you hear the invitation? And then in that final um, space, where do you need to change? Where do you need support? And what might this look like here in our community? Those would be critical to talk about together. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep this, I guess, like this. Is it OK? Are you going, uh, Jane, are you starting to move people into groups? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. so let's see here. Um, awesome. Actually, um, there we go. That's not it. Um. All right, all these great faces coming back. Oh, there's there's Sister Roseanne. <laughs> Hi there. So as we're <laughs> as we're returning now, if any of you has a very particular question you'd like to pose to Jillian or to the group, uh, feel free to to put that into the chat right now. are going to send out a five page PDF 
with the um, quotes that were part of the slides so that you'll have easy access to all of these uh, paragraphs one by one. You can work with them, pray with them, copy one of them and put it on your mirror and look <laughs> at it every day or make flashcards of them or whatever you would like. Okay, good. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but in our group, we talked a bit at, at the beginning, at least about how hopeful some of this was in a very practical and realistic way. I don't know if that was a theme in other groups, what people thought. Uh, we were commenting on the um, inauguration that there did seem to be themes of hope in terms of uh, mm -hmm. caring for those who have suffered from the pandemic and um, mm -hmm. the immigrants and uh, the environment that it seemed like a lot of the life issues were being addressed. Mm -hmm. We talked about that in spite of the coronavirus and being locked in, we've been more aware of nature and like the sound of birds and those kinds of things that we might not have noticed before. Mm -hmm. yeah. It did not come up from our group actually, but uh, in speaking of hope, something we did not mention, I think is a, a, a source of hope is the spontaneous and the grassroots efforts to help people over the last year, particularly in terms of responding to the economic crisis uh, brought on by the pandemic and the food distribution and the, and the six-year-old kids who are delivering pizzas and, and things all over the country that are, are uh, uh, maybe little resurrections throughout our, our yeah. nation on an individual yeah. basis in this. And while uh, I, I think inauguration sets some a basis for hope for a future from a, uh, a greater level, the governmental level, I think that still needs to play out over the next couple of weeks to see whether hope along those lines is actually grounded in what what people are willing to come together to do. So we'll have to see on that. I think, um, we're, we're aware of, of uh, families that um, instead of giving um, uh, maybe the uh, usual round of gifts to their loved ones at Christmas time, uh, uh, chose to make gifts to places like Free Store Food Bank and uh, other places you know that, that are helping the people in need and that's, that's been a way that people have, have reached out, you know, talked to mm -hmm. other people about that. And we, I mean, we did the same thing in our family. We just sort of talked about it ahead of time and agreed that was the way to go and realized how fortunate we are to be where we are mm -hmm. uh, and um, in, a situ in a position where um, we can do that. And that, um, that's, that's um, I think that that's pretty, pretty frequent among people we've talked to. Probably worth just underlining that like love, hope is a noun and a verb. And um, it's often experienced or it begins to emerge in a simple act or in um, a connection, a form of engagement, however small, um, however simple, um, but that it, it emerges in those ways that we can be connected to one another. And I think part of the big challenge and invitation of our times is to constantly seek those connections in meaningful ways as well as in simple ways. Um, but it's in, the, it's in that connectedness that we find um, 
all kinds of creative ways of engaging in solidarity, engaging the connections that allow the divine to move in the spaces between us in the midst of the human community. Julian, I would just like to say, based on the discussion in our room, I think we all found something very inspiring to uh, reflect on. And um, I know I speaking for myself, I've never paid real close attention to the writings of Pope Francis. I just haven't done it. And this was really an inspiring introduction for me into some writings that I need to take more seriously. So I really thank you for that. Saying that. One, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, and I think one of the things that I got from tonight, and I've been reading and um, been part of a discussion group on uh, the recent encyclical, uh, Fratelli Tutti. And I, um, what struck me about your presentation was how consistent Francis seems to be. Um, when you talk about what he said at Lampedusa. Um, and I was thinking about um, the recent encyclical talks about um, the Good Samaritan this, and the stranger in the road and how different people respond. And it's, um, it, I just found some really s similar themes that Francis brings out. It's, it's you know, it's really powerful. And, and at the same time, very hopeful, I think, too. Thanks, Dave. Consistency and vision. It's just, a, you know, it's what's amazing to me um, as someone who has both kind of studied and taught Pope Francis's writings over the course of his papacy, it's like each book is full, you know, chock full of little insights, but then you, it's almost like if you were shuffling a deck of cards, you know, if you, if you took bits, if, if each deck of cards was one of the books, um, you can reshuffle that deck and it, it speaks freshly. Um, so there's a consistency and yet there's a, a real vitality to his message and to the many ways that he embodies it so that it's a very, very living word. And I think that's part of what inspires us and what makes us feel maybe a little more um, courageous um, and hopefully inspired to imitate, you know, to, 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 to do, to be the change that we long for and hope for, to not wait for hope to come find us on the sofa. <laughs> I thought that his finest work was still the first piece, the joy of the gospel. I just found that to be so powerful. Um, interpreting the gospel in this way, to be joyful and, and to be humble. Um, he just distills it down to something very, very simple. And, and all of his writings since then, I think, have have flowed from the joy of the gospel. He, he put that out there as his um, essential message for his papacy and these other writings since then have, you know, developed those themes, but that, that just uh, was a whole paradigm shift and especially coming from a Pope. I find myself thinking, well, kind of obviously the whole thing in terms of these times and COVID and so forth and what do they say about us and what we should do now. But the other thing I think of a lot is, um, I, I, I'm sure we hear in terms of our society and there was one phrase early on, I didn't jot it down, but the time we spend on trivialities and peripheral things and all and the amount of attention and devotion and energy we give to those things and why. And I just wonder if that strikes all cultures that they do that. Well, is that a particularly somewhat American thing at times? I don't know, but I think it's definitely part of our culture. One thing that came out of our group was that um, these discussions and everything finally have to lead to real action. 
uh, whether it's volunteering, whether it's giving, whether it's um, being a friend, whether it's just actual helping your neighbor somehow, and the neighbor in the broadest term, I think is the, is the real challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to what, uh, what Connie had said about, you know, about superficiality and, and, and just to, you know, to acknowledge that I think that is a real temptation. And I think that it, it, even, um, the, even the times, the, these times of lockdown, of not always knowing how to fill our time, quote unquote. Um, maybe some people have that problem or temptation more than others, uh, certainly. But um, I, I think that Pope Francis's invitation is to make use of each day as opportunity for learning, for exploration of self, of world, of what it is to be human, of what it is to be cr created um, and, and what it is, what that means about being a part then of creation. Um, and also that life is precious and we don't know how much longer we'll have in any given day. And so, you know, how to make best use of the gift that uh, our being here is for, our, uh, for the world and for one another. Mm -hmm. I did get a question on the chat. Can I um, pose it? Mm -hmm. You know, or let me read it to you because uh, it's, uh, I love the question, I may as well, right? Based on your reading and study of Pope Francis, can you expound on your understanding of his use of the word tenderness? Well, gosh, I'd love to, since I wrote a book called The Tenderness of God, <laughs> uh, the subtitle of which was Reclaiming Our Humanity. And I spent a long time, I really feel like in many ways that was sort of a given title. I knew Tenderness of God, but I didn't know the subtitle, um, Reclaiming Our Humanity. And, I, and to me, it has everything to do with um, the, kind of the loss of some of the practices of simplicity, community, depth of conversation, um, when we are so much a part of a technologically driven culture and society. And how if we are going to reclaim what is humane about us, about humanity, um, it's going to require us to look carefully at how we fill our time, how we spend our time, what our habits are. Um, and in all of that, um, what matters most and how to reach what matters most. Um, so in that process of reclaiming our humanity um, and all of the humane emotions and sensitivities that we're capable of, a certain vulnerability, a certain uh, willingness to be simple, um, to open our hearts and our minds to the reality of life and to the, our capacity to be connected to God and to one another. Um, in my own personal experience, I certainly have learned tenderness at the hand of God. Um, and I have certainly also um, been graced to have some relationships where I can explore what it is to quote unquote, live and love tenderly, which is part of the Old Testament prophetic tradition that um, is one of the things that God asks of us to love tenderly and to walk humbly with our God. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's that tender, the tender way by, I think what Pope Francis means by tenderness, or maybe I shouldn't speak for him, what I understand <laughs> that tenderness um, to, to really mean is that our, our formability, our malleability, our changeability, what part of what makes us tender also makes us capable of being formed and shaped into something more continually. If we think of, you know, the loving hands of a creator God forming and continually forming us like a potter with clay, then we're going to need a certain tenderness, a certain willingness, you know, to be malleable, to be reformed. Um, and so I think it's, it's actually critical that we explore a kind of ontological tenderness um, that is ours, created as we are in the image and likeness of, 
a very tender God. That's interesting because my initial thoughts would be so different. And I think of tenderness immediately as a relational thing mm -hmm. with someone else mm. more than a personal forming myself sort of thing, I guess. I think the challenge is to be a friend and a neighbor to people that are outside your normal social circle. And that includes different races, um, people with different sexual orientation, um, et cetera. I think it also includes an ability to withhold judgment so that um, no. as we're relating with people, we're not um, better than or looking down at or assuming making assumptions. Yeah, I think judgment often comes from a harder heart. Yeah. You know, from a certain yeah. hardness of heart. Yeah. I also just wanted to make sure that I didn't misspeak that, you know, when I was trying to put words around tenderness, I didn't mean really that we could form ourselves. Uh -huh. You know, so, so I do think of it as being um, kind of grounded in it's certainly grounded in relationship, but also in trustworthy relationship. And in my, in my experience, that has been almost first and foremost, a relationship with God. So a, kind of a being formed, um, continually formed and reformed in that relationship with God. And then as that, you know, as it is um, safe and as we have capacity to explore that with other people, friends and strangers, then, then we're kind of empowered through our tenderness to do that. A thought back to uh, Connie's uh, brought up about the obsession with the frivolous uh, and, the, and the extent of it in our society, yes. But it's not unique to society. As we look at the whole, I don't know, world history as well, but the course of Western civilization, every time a society became affluent, the, those who controlled the affluence or were most affluent just degraded themselves into the most frivolous activities that they could be imagined for their time. So we're, we're consistent with our original sin. We just are followed that pattern. Mm. And yet there's a blessing of leisure time to have the blessing of being frivolous. Yes. <laughs> and, and to a certain imbalance, but uh, looking at birds in the backyard, is that frivolous or is that something else? You know, uh, going Rest fishing, is that frivolous? Or <laughs> it, so it is, it is a blessing of affluence, I think, as well. Yeah, and, and an excellent point there, Dennis, the, the importance of leisure. Yeah. And it's, Leisure is necessary also to finding God in our lives, right? Yeah, I don't think that's for the listen. <laughs> yeah, also related to Connie's point, I think is Francis's uh, the globalization of indifference. I think that's just such a powerful expression. It's a scary one. Yeah. Yeah. Even our indifference to the number of people who have died from COVID. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or are sick with COVID. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah, those kinds of sensitivities, I think, are direct manifestations of, uh, of tenderness. Yeah. You know, yeah. that when we can stay sensitive and not indifferent mm -hmm. to human suffering, yeah. to those who are not with us. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look around a circle and realize, oh my gosh, I don't see anyone who fill in the blank, you know, to then question why, why not? What's going on? Where, where is, whether it's a, an individual person who's missing or a group that's missing or. It is 8.30, uh, so I'll, I'll wrap this up. I apologize to all of you for not getting these questions sent out to you. Um, so I'm going to send these questions to you along with the PDF that Jillian has prepared. So you'll have 
both the notes of her talk and these questions that you could sit with um, you know, in the next days or, or the next week and so on. Um, our next presentation will be two weeks from tonight, as Jillian said, with John Snagaki on uh, applied theology, uh, living out our Catholic social teaching. So Jillian, thank you. Thank you so much for generously being with us and uh, reminding you. us about how just how wonderful and uh, humble and joyful a person our Pope is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all for having me and for being the community that you and we are together. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank all you right. so much. Yes. Thank you very Good night, much. all. Good night, friends. Thank you.